Welcome to this in-person program of the Stanford Historical Society. I'm John Gifford, co-chair of the program committee. Richard White will speak to us about his new book, Who Killed Jane Stanford? A Gilded Tale of Murder, Deceit, Spirits, and the Birth of a University. Richard White, Margaret Byrne Professor in American History Emeritus, is a distinguished scholar of the American West. He has written a number of important works in environmental history, the growth of the West, Native American cultures, water issues, and the making of the Transcontinental Railroad. Richard has been a MacArthur Fellow, two-time winner of the Francis Parkman Prize, and past president of both the Organization of American Historians and the Western History Association. He is an elected member of the American Philosophical Society, but just as important are Richard's many awards for distinguished teaching and mentoring. Richard's numerous publications reflect a career that has been grand in its temporal and spatial scope and humanizing in its approach to its subjects. Of special importance to this book on the death of Jane Stanford is Richard's Mastery of the Gilded Age where his extensive work with documents is showing that, at the time, corruption was quite pervasive. In the course of his research for his magisterial railroaded and the monumental Oxford History of the United States for the era, he found that potentially incriminating papers were often destroyed. But just as often, frank letters were kept unguarded and equally damning. Indeed, earlier investigations into Jane Stanford's death, including those by Stanford authors Robert Cutler and Bliss Carnegie, could not yield consensus using the then available evidence. In an effort to get to the truth, Richard, often accompanied by his undergraduate students, took several deep dives into the li library's special collections, of which this book is in part a result. Richard surmises that interest in protecting the young, still vulnerable university may have had some role in Jane Stanford's death. We'll leave Richard to name suspects or motives, but one of Richard's main themes is, like the railroads and many other Gilded Age projects, how provisional and fragile Stanford University was as an institution at the beginning of its history. As for the narrative, which the publisher touts is likely to be the last word on the case, this Richard will now share with us. We are particularly fortunate, as the book has just been published today, and this is the first time that Richard will speak to a live audience about it. Following Richard's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. Those of you here in SAP Center, please present yourselves to one of the two microphone stands that will be set up at the end of each aisle. Those of you at home on Zoom can send questions anytime using the Q&A function. We will do our best to address as many questions as possible before we adjourn to our annual reception, where all are welcome, and where Richard's book will be available for purchase and signing, and we can continue the conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, Richard White. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, let me make sure that I get the slides working, which I, they apparently do. As Jonathan said, I've just finished, or just published a book entitled, Who Killed Jane Stanford? But I'm not gonna tell you who killed Jane Stanford. You're gonna have to buy the book. <laughs> or you're gonna have to talk to somebody who bought the book, or you're gonna have to look it up on the internet, but you're not gonna get it out of me. What you will get this afternoon is how it could happen, when it happened, and how once it happened, it seemed almost overdetermined. I will tell you how to, I will to also tell you how and why it was covered up. Jane Stanford was the wife of Leland Stanford and one of the richest women in California. She was a co-founder of Leland Stanford Junior University, which was a monument to her dead son. In 1905, she ingested strychnine twice within six weeks. 
The first time was on Saturday, January 14th, in her bedroom, in her mansion, on Knob Hill. The mansions here, along with the other associates of the, of the um, Southern Pacific Railroad, look like small villages, and really they, they were. Somebody put a copious amount, well, I should go to Knob Hill, which is what this looked like in 1905 before the earthquake. Someone put copious amounts of rat poison in her Poland Spring bottled water. I was going to bring actually a bottle of Poland Spring bottled water, which still exists, except one of my grown children drank it and didn't tell me about it. <laughs> she vomited and sent, her, and sent the bottle out for analysis. Then she and her brother, Charles Lathrop, who's up there right now, Let's go back and her lawyer, Mountford Wilson, hired detectives to keep the matter secret. That was the first poisoning. The second time was on February 28th at the Moana Hotel, which you see up here, in Honolulu, Hawaii. She was there because she was fleeing from the first poisoning. Someone in this poisoning put a precise dose of strychnine in her bicarbonate of soda. She died quickly, within roughly 10 minutes after the arrival of the hotel doctor. As a spiritualist, she usually refused to use the word death, believing in the words of a poem she loved, the death was but a kiss bestowed when you were reunited with your lost relatives. But when she met death, she called it by name. This, she said, is a terrible death to die. A coroner's jury in Honolulu ruled her death a poisoning at the hands of persons or persons unknown. This is Jane Stanford, this picture is supposedly taken on her departure to Honolulu. And this is the headlines. This will dominate the papers in San Francisco for weeks. Mrs. Stanford is dead at Honolulu. And this is her death mask, which still exists in the library, that when I taught the class, um, I would have the archivist bring out the death mask, and it was this Jane Stanford had just walked into the room, given the reaction of the students. They would gasp. And she looks, not surprisingly, very, very dead. <laughs> now, that Jane Stanford was murdered runs against Stanford University's account of her life and death. Until quite recently, the university has cited a now vanished autopsy that they had commissioned, but never actually revealed or published. They claimed that she had died of a heart attack. Now Stanford University usually says nothing about it. Even before she was in the mausoleum, the university had begun to craft a picture of her that um, endures down to the present day. The official picture of Jane Stanford is that she no longer believed in spiritualism. She had renounced it before she died. Spiritualism was a belief in the direct communication with the dead. The official version emphasized her Christianity. She was, as the Reverend De John Dinsmore said in a campus memorial service, um, a good woman. This is, that is the best thing that can be said of anyone. She was a noble queen with high ideals, fixed principles, and unfaltering perseverance. This is a Jane Stanford commemorated at Founders Day. She was a worthy steward of great wealth, and the university insisted she had no enemies. There was no reason that any sane person would want to kill Jane Stanford. David Starr Jordan, the first president of Stanford University, adopted Dismore's phrase for his The Story of a Good Woman, a pamphlet which is still in print. David Starr Jordan has not fared well recently. Jordan Hall is no longer Jordan Hall, but his assessment of Jane Stanford is still alive and well. The university renamed Sarah Way Jane Stanford Way. The current president of Stanford says it was done, quote, to honor Jane Stanford whose vision and strength played a central role in guiding and sustaining the university during its critical early years. I will say more about vision, guiding, and sustaining later. 
I became interested in Jane Stanford's death after the publication of Robert Cutler's, this isn't Cutler's book, it's Jordan's, The Mysterious Death of Jane Stanford, when he established that she had been poisoned. I thought investigating her death was a way to teach students to use the archives and evaluate evidence. They did wonderful work, but the classes were only 10 weeks long, and there was only so much that they could do. Initially, I did not set out to solve the mystery. I wanted to use Jane Stanford's death as a lens to understand the origins of Leland Stanford Junior University and to examine Gilded Age San Francisco, its class relations, its race relations, its corruption, its politics. And I think Who Killed Jane Stanford does those things. Because I've found many times books have a way of taking on a life of their own. My students and I found out that there were quite a few people who either had a motive to kill Jane Stanford or who were very relieved that she was dead. <laughs> All of the suspects worked for Mrs. Stanford, as she called herself, but then virtually everyone close to Jane Stanford worked for her. Not only her servants, but also the faculty and administration of Stanford University, which for all practical purposes she owned. And she didn't let people forget it. Even her Lathrop relatives, by and large, worked for her. Now, investigating the suspects that we found in the classes and their motives forms the plot line of the book. Bertha Berner, who you see here, her secretary and one of the suspects knew that ultimately Jane Stanford's influence boiled down to her money. Mrs. Stanford, she wrote, came to rule people through her wealth. And no crown or title could have made her rule more absolute, nor the realization of her power more clear in her mind. Berner felt the power of that money repeatedly. Jane Stanford used it to control Berner's time and her romantic and sexual life. Jane Stanford forced Berner to place her employer's needs over those of Berner's own sick mother. The president of Stanford, David Starr Jordan, was both a suspect and a man who played a prominent role in covering up her murder. Jordan claimed that Mrs. Stanford had died of a heart attack, brought on by, among other things, eating soggy gingerbread. <laughs> Death by gingerbread is to this day not a common <laughs> medical diagnosis. He also publicly denied Jane Stanford's spiritualism while privately publishing thinly, thinly veiled satires of her spiritualist belief. The good woman had subjected him to constant humiliations, some large and some petty, through her financial control of the university. You're sitting in actually a building which commemorated one of them. My students actually first found this, this document. It's a letter from Jane Stanford denouncing, Jane, denouncing David Starr Jordan for spending too much money on the door jams in the chemistry building. <laughs> door jams cost two fifty dollars apiece. She said that was way too much. He, was, he had acted out of line. He should have submitted this. She wanted the door jams removed. And you can sort of imagine Jordan sitting at his desk, the president of Stanford University, thinking, door jams, door jams? I'm the president of this university, and she's writing me about door jams. She created what Stanford called, or what Jordan called, Stanford Stone Age. Early Stanford University, which is now gone, or largely gone, was a memorial to the Stanfords. This is the memorial arch. Um, the memorial arch here. He has tumbled down the 1906 earthquake, as you'll see. Behind it is the statue of the Stanford family, which would be the next thing you saw as you came in. Um, that is now down at the mausoleum that was exiled quite some time ago. And behind that is the original church, which, as you can see, is not the same church as today. And that hanging in front of it was a banner, a painted banner, which said, dedicated to the glory of God and my husband, Leland Stanford Sr. That was part of the memorials. The other one, again, is the museum, which today is a minor part of the university, but once for Jane Stanford was the center of the university. And as you can see, was a much bigger building than it is today. It, too, came down, by and large, in the earthquake. David Starr Jordan said, by building these buildings, 
She was starving the rest of the university, the part that was actually supposed to be a functioning university, of funds. She also forced Jordan to become the public face in the Ross affair, the academic scandal that made Stanford the poster child for the suppression of academic freedom in the early 20th century. In the winter of 1904 and 1905, weeks before her death, she had decided to fire David Starr Jordan. Only her death saved his job. And then there are the servants. Albert Beverly, who you can see with the derby hat on the camel back there, was the English butler who, along with Bertha Berner, who's next to him on the other camel, um, and Berner was probably his lover, both of them were embezzling money from Jane Stanford. Be but, excuse me, Beverly had previously worked for Lily Langtree, who was the opposite of Jane Stanford. She was sexually, she had sexually adventurous, a sometimes actress, and perhaps the first woman who was famous simply for being famous. Beverly initially became the prime suspect. Elizabeth Richmond, who you can see in the hat next to Jane Stanford there, was seen as another suspect. Sometimes the newspapers cast her as Beverly's accomplice and agent, and sometimes they cast her as acting independently because she was a rival of Berners. Ah Wing, who I don't have a picture of, had the longest tenure of any of Mrs. Stanford's servants. He had nursed another of Mrs. Stanford's brothers through his last illness, cirrhosis of the liver, and had been promised a reward in that brother's will. The money instead went to Jane Stanford. She in turn promised Ah Wing money in her will, but only if he delayed his return to China and his own family until after her death. Um, Finally, there were her Lathrop relatives, some of whom she had disinherited. They were eager that her fortune go to them rather than the university and were constantly seeking out ways to challenge her will. George Crothers, the trustee and lawyer who knew where the bodies were buried, lived in fear that the Lathrop relatives would exploit the questions about Jane's sanity to undercut her will and grants to the university. And Crothers is the person whose papers probably provide the best guide to what was going on during these years. All of these people had a motive for murder, and there were far more people, dismissed faculty, other servants, clergy she had treated badly, who would not regret her demise. The year after her death, her sister-in-law, Annie Stanford, described the earthquake that destroyed all the chief monuments of the Stanford family, the destruction I just showed you of the Memorial Arch, the museum, and the Memorial Church as, quote, almost an act of just retribution for Jane's cruelty and vindictiveness. And there were other people, including the university administration, her lawyers, the San Francisco police, and key relatives who had reason to support the elaborate cover-up to make her death seem natural. Now, I have collaborated with members of my family on several of my books. My mother on With Remembering a Hanagram, which I've come to think of as an Annie memoir. My son Jesse on California Exposures, which is my personal favorite of the books that I have written. And now with my brother Stephen on Who Killed Jane Stanford. My brother Stephen writes crime fiction. As my mother told Jesse when he was still a child, your uncle writes real books, not like your father. People read them. <laughs> Stephen's fiction incorporates actual situations and characters based on real people, often his relatives. Long before Encanto's We Don't Talk About Bruno, my family had learned we don't talk to Stephen. <laughs> Unless you actually want to veil versions of your life to appear in print. Stephen used actual incidents, but his books remained fiction. He made things up when he needed a solution. He invents the necessary evidence and creates plausible connections. They don't have to be true. They only have to be plausible. I'm a historian. I can't invent. Still, my brother in crime writing and classic mystery writing had a lot to teach me. As I explain in the book, the common analogy of the historian as a detective is misguided, but still, Dashiell Hammett might as well have been a historian 
when he opens the Maltese Falcon, which is set in San Francisco, with Sam Spade, the detective, instructing his client, suppose you tell me about it from the beginning, and we'll know what needs doing. Better begin as far back as you can. And that's what I do in Who Killed Jane Stanford. I go back to the creation of the university. Now, in the Maltese Falcon, everyone is lying. And I entitle one of my chapters in the book, Everyone Was Lying. <laughs> Historians like detectives not only expect people to lie, they depend on it. If people did not lie, historians and detectives would not have work, at least not very interesting work. They don't assume that everyone lies all the time, just that some people lie some of the time. And they also presume that lies are as revealing as the truth. They just disclose different things. In Jane Stanford's case, lies worked not because I believed them, but because they distracted me, leading me away from the important things. The important things were not the lies. The important things were what my suspects did not talk about at all. Historians are trained to reveal lies as soon as they discover them, but mysteries need suspense. The general rule, as my brother kept reminding me, is wait for it. As a historian, I usually open a book by blurting everything out. I write like a prosecutor, not a novelist, but not in this book. My lessons went beyond plotting. Stephen walked me through what amounts to a police procedural, common to both actual detectives and to crime writers. Detectives need to establish means, motive, and opportunity. In every case, there are choke points the opportunity where the murderer or his or her agents have to be present, and at that moment they need the means and the motive to commit the crime. If they cannot be connected to these tight confluences, then they must be eliminated as suspects. Now in true crime, in crime fiction, and in mystery novels, there is a detective or a surrogate who, while flawed and imperfect, is interested in seeing justice done. The investigator becomes a sympathetic proxy for the reader. My book has few sympathetic characters. And many people far more interested in covering up the crime than in solving it. The Harry Morse Detective Agency and its chief operative, Detective Jules Cullenden, who you see right here in a newspaper portrait, were hired by the Stanford Estate not to solve the crime, but to cover it up. The San Francisco Police Department, which was corrupt, well, they told me this would happen, there you go, which was corrupt and inept in the best of times, was actually kept in the dark over the first poisoning. It was never reported to them. And in the second, it was embroiled in a scandal in Chinatown, which you see the China Squad here in both its 1890s version and here in its early 20th century version. And these investigations and scandals in Chinatown involve many of the same people who were involved in investigating the Stanford murder. It led them into relations with the six companies, which you see here. These are the officers of the six companies. And the person, the detective, who in the end was in charge of investigating the Stanford murder was this man, who you'll hear more about in a minute, Jeremiah Deenan, who soon after Jane Stanford's death at the conclusion of the investigation was made chief of the San Francisco police. He supported Jordan's denial that she had died by strychnine poisoning or that she had been murdered at all. The Honolulu police did investigate, but they were underfunded. They had turned the final phase of the investigation over to the San Francisco Police Department, and they came to regret that. The only people who seemed to seek justice were Fremont Older, who you see here, a newspaper editor, and far more equivocally, George Crothers, the Stanford trustee, confidant to Jane Stanford, and one of her lawyers. Crothers' influence originated in his resemblance to Jane Stanford's dead son, Leland Jr. Although the phrase is anachronistic, Jane Stanford stalked Crothers when he was an undergraduate. 
She used to follow him around on campus in her carriage. This is both creepy and touching. <laughs> when he became a trustee, she routinely called him to her mansion, often in the middle of the night. He wrote her last wills and trusts. Crothers never doubted that Jane Stanford had been murdered, but he obstructed the investigation. He withheld critical evidence, a letter Jane Stanford had written him before his departure to Hawaii that vanished for 30 years, that clearly showed Mrs. Stanford was in fear for her life. Crothers feared both murder and suicide, would threaten the university, which many, including Charles Eliot, the president of Harvard, already regarded as a giant exercise in money laundering. The letter <laughs> indicated murder, but Crothers feared suicide even more. Suicide in the early 20th century was often considered prima facie evidence of mental incompetence, which could void any will or any trust. Stories already circulated about Mrs. Stanford's spiritualism, her very unusual opinions on many subjects, and her odd behavior. And these created doubts about her mental competence. Timothy Hopkins, the adopted son of Mark Hopkins, one of Leland Stanford's associates, and a Stanford family friend, this is a Stanford family friend, was telling people that, quote, Mrs. Stanford was always queer. Her spiritualism granted, created grounds for challenges to her wills and trusts since she claimed that she got regular advice from her dead husband and son. Ghosts, so to speak, lack legal standing. Crothers' ultimate loyalty was to the university, not to Mrs. Stanford. By the time of her death, Crothers had plenty of practice of avoiding the consequences of what Jane Stanford did or said. In his own words, he took, quote, meticulous care to avoid any disclosure in detail of the wholly illegal provisions of Mrs. Stanford's amendments and attempted amendments of the university trusts or in her so-called addresses. These provisions, he says, range from the apparently trivial to the colossal. In regard to the trust grants and university charter, some, if not all, of Mrs. Stanford's amendments were clearly invalid. Until her death, Crothers was not satisfied that the grants she made could withstand legal scrutiny. Unlike Crothers and Jordan, not everyone thought that the university was worth saving. Horace Davis, one of the university's few discerning trustees, described Leland Stanford University before Jane Stanford's death as a system of absolutism, a place rotten with imperiousness, mismanagement, ineptitude, and fear. The Ross affair, in which Mrs. Stanford forced the dismissal of Edward Ross, a sociologist, for his political and racial views, was one of the first scandals, affairs as they were called at the time, that divided the university. Jane Stanford, a woman supposedly without enemies, cultivated enmity and harvested a bountiful crop. Which brings me back to the university's recent praise of Jane Stanford's vision and strength and her central role in guiding and sustaining the university. Despite publicity, at the time that the, despite publicity at the time and down to the present day, the university was not originally rich. Leland Stanford told Jordan he would eventually give the university $30 million, but the actual endowment he gave the university before his death consisted of three ranches. The largest, Vena, had never turned a, pro a profit, and its grapevine soon died of phylloxera. The Gridley Ranch produced grain, but its production was in steep decline. The Palo Alto Ranch, where we're standing right now, which housed the university, was famous for its trotting horses. But the stables lost $7,000 every year. George Crothers complained that the ranches brought, quote, nothing but taxes. To construct the first buildings and finance the university, Leland Stanford did not give them any money at all. He borrowed $1.5 million from the Pacific Improvement Company, nicknamed the private interest company, because essentially it was a slush fund for the, associate, for the associates of the Southern Pacific Railroad. The PIC drained corporate railroad assets and turned them into private assets. The PIC made distributions when times were good, but at other times, and at other times, the associates could borrow from it. But in the 1890s, times were not good. The PIC itself 
borrowed heavily during the depression of the 1890s and owed $28 million, of which Stanford was responsible for 25%. Leland Stanford and the associates also failed to pay back the loans made by the government for the Central Pacific Railroad. When the government sued to get the money, the university's fate was in the balance. But the failure of that suit did not end the financial or legal problems. It's usually treated as, oh, Stanford escaped that one. It didn't escape. The founding documents of the university were such a mess that it took an amendment to the California Constitution, engineered by Crothers, to clean it up, and then only partially. For years, Mrs. Stanford retained control over most of the funds in the Stanford estate, and she wavered on supporting the university. Crothers was never certain she would not starve it of funds or change its purpose. Several times she seemed ready to convert to Catholicism and turn the university over to the Jesuits. <laughs> At other times, she considered transferring the whole thing to Columbia University. Although the university charter made it co-educational, she threatened to banish women from the university. In the years before her death, she was in a near constant state of sexual <laughs> panic. In December 1904, a month before her first poisoning, Jane Stanford wrote Jordan from New York demanding an end, quote, to the free and familiar intercourse between men and women. The girls in the sororities were, quote, lawless and free in their social relations with young men. These are the women she was scared of. <laughs> Jordan had the power to restrict this, and she demanded that he do so. To appease her, the Board of Trustees at the time of the first poisoning was considering draconian regulations to police women students. The Board would increase the age of admission of women from 16 to 18, and as soon as possible thereafter to 20. This quote will practically limit the female students to the advanced and graduate courses. The age of the women will greatly exceed that of men. There would be a moral policing to banish any sign of sexual attraction between students on campus. A system of matrons would be put in place with, quote, full authority to enforce discipline over the female students. Watchmen and mounted guards would report any infractions of discipline and turn the culprit over to the university authorities for punishment. Warnings would be issued to those who are conspicuous in their attention to the opposite sex. All of this detracted from Stanford's already troubled reputation. Between the scandals, Jordan's control over academics, and Jane Stanford's control over finances, it could neither recruit prominent faculty nor retain its best faculty. The American philosopher William James, when he was a visiting professor at Stanford, the, excuse me, the year after Jane Stanford's death, said its trustees aspired to make it, quote, little more than a second-rate teaching college. James had it backwards. It was a second-rate teaching college. But Jordan aspired to more. Jane Stanford's vision for the university was, quote, to keep the university in the highest level morally and spiritually. The latter is more deeply interesting to me from the fact that it seems to be lost sight of, in a sense. The development of the soul was the university's essential task. It was, quote, by far the most essential thing in life. All education should tend to this one aim, and this is only attained by following the teachings and maxims of that greatest of all teachers our world has ever known our precious Savior, Jesus Christ. And this phase in the education of youth is far more important than professors, as a rule, realize. She was right. Professors did not realize this. <laughs> but now she had told them. The failure of the police investigation of her murder cannot be separated from the political controversies and corruption of San Francisco. Leland Stanford and the Southern Pacific machine it helped corrupt the city. And that corruption blew back to influence the investigation of his wife's death. Jerry Deenan, the chief police detective in the investigation of her murder, is, her murder cooperated with Jordan's cover-up. But soon after, he became chief of police through his association with boss Abraham Ruth, as you see here, who later went to prison. Deenan himself, back there, Deenan himself collaborated with Kid Kelly, who ran organized crime in the city. And Deenan was a fair sample of the San Francisco police. 
A muckraking piece of McClure's magazine said that by the end of 1906, the department was, quote, so demoralized and so corrupt that it might all, almost be said to constitute a distinct criminal class. In 1908, Francis Heaney, the special prosecutor who brought down Mayor Eugene Schmitz and Roof, arraigned Roof on additional causes of counts of bribery. During the trial, an assassin put more, an assassin named Morris Hass put a pistol to Heaney's ear and pulled the trigger. trigger. Heaney miraculously survived. <laughs> Haas did not. While well, under police guard, he supposedly committed suicide in his cell. Somehow he had obtained a derringer. The district attorney's office and the Citizens League of Justice accused the new police chief, Bigging, of, who had succeeded Deenan, of being complicit in Haas's death. With Ruth's trial still underway, Biggie disappeared from a police launch in San Francisco Bay. The only man with him on the launch could not explain how he had vanished. <laughs> Biggie's body was found floating in the bay two weeks later. In this city, Mrs. Stanford's death was more notable than unusual. This was a city where newspaper editors got shot and assaulted on the street, where the editor of the San Francisco Examiner hired the gunfighter Wyatt Earp as a bodyguard and listed him on the payroll as a library attache. <laughs> the Tong Wars of Chinatown, which influenced the investigation of Jane Stanford's murder, are well known, but I had never encountered the wonderfully named Chinese Educational Society before. Nominally an organization of Chinese in alliance with Protestant missionaries to foster Western education, it functioned as a kind of Chinese mafia. It fought to control labor contracting, gambling, prostitution, and the smuggling of women and opium. It, too, became part of the Stanford investigation. In context, the cover-up of Jane Stanford's murder was not all that surprising. <coughs> Investigating this story has been a challenge. Preservation of historical records is always imperfect, and the 1906 earthquake destroyed a large chunk of them. But rarely have I encountered more documents, collections, and reports, ones that survived the earthquake or were created after the earthquake, that have gone missing than in this research. Jane Stanford apparently destroyed most of Leland's records, and many of Jane's have disappeared. Except for a memoir, most of her secretary Bertha Berner's papers are gone without a trace. Jane's niece Jenny was working on a book of her own when she died in 1934. She said that she had sent her research materials to Stanford University, but they seemed to have disappeared. The autopsy commissioned by the Stanford Estate to counter the autopsy in Hawaii, once in the possession of the university, has vanished. These lost records test my belief that the past cannot be erased, but my faith remains intact. An original letter can go missing, but a response remains. A report can disappear, but accounts of that report survive. Participants in events lie, but it is virtually impossible to find and destroy all the materials that undermine the lie. On the day of Jane Stanford's funeral, the procession from the church stretched nearly a mile to the mausoleum. Directly behind the casket came Charles Lathrop and his family. Behind the Lathrops was Bertha Burner, who was escorted by her brother. Following them were the servants, among them Ah Wing. Jordan and Hopkins were at the head of the university delegation. If someone had made, wished to make a macabre joke, they could not have done better than this. Leading her professed session to the grave were the people suspected of her murder, people who covered it up, and those she despised and wished to fire. <laughs> Reverend Charles Brown, a man she loathed and instructed her brother never to employ at the university, awaited her at the mausoleum to deliver the last words. <laughs> the funeral ended with a prayer for the university. But in a sense, the university's prayer was already answered. <laughs> Jane Stanford was dead. Her money would go to Leland Stanford Junior University. There were plenty of people who had a motive to kill Jane Stanford, and far more who had a motive to cover up the killing. To find out who did kill her, how and why, and how officials in the university and the estate engineered the cover-up, you'll need to read the book. Thank you. So let us begin. Please line up. 
uh, I can ask one question from the uh, Wall Street, that came in, came in, from the uh, Wall Street Journal said that uh, almost every character in your book was a dastardly character. Were there any good people that you found? I haven't found them. <laughs> um, the people involved in this were remarkably self-serving. Um, George Crothers, I think, was somebody who it would, he would see would justify to this day what he did is saving Stanford University. Um, but otherwise, Leland Stanford Jr. did no real harm that I can see. Um, <laughs> the co-eds at Stanford University did no real harm. But David Starr Jordan, um, Jane Stanford, the Board of Trustees, who very often themselves had insider contracts, it was hard to find admirable people. That was part of my problem in writing the book. I, I wanted a hero to follow through, and um, I never found the hero. Yes, please ask your question directly. In the microphone, this is being recorded, so we wanted one to speak into the microphones. Okay. So that was wonderful. My question is, even though you, you're not going to reveal who killed her, do you want to say something more about your historical research methods and the sleuthing and how you found this and sort of what the order was, if you will? My, my methods are um, pretty simple. I read everything. <laughs> but where did you find them? And where were you? Uh, most of the stuff I would find, I started through going through the newspapers. Um, but I did more than the newspapers. I went through David Starr Jordan's papers. David Starr Jordan kept everything. And after a while, there's an index to David Starr Jordan's papers, which are quite useful. But then I found these files. David Starr Jordan had a series of files, which I can't prove, but I came to think of as blackmail files. Um, <laughs> they're files that could be used. One of them was a police report that probably, or an informant who probably could have sent Ah Wing to his death. Um, Another one was a report, which I don't think was true, about Leland Stanford Sr. having um, a child out of wedlock, which I can only assume he kept because if he needed to use that against Jane, he would. Um, so there are things like that. But it began, you, after you begin to see these kinds of sidelights to it. But there are other parts that, um, when you find it, I, there's a letter from Chinatown, which is, I talk about in the book. I, I never could finally decipher it. It was just a, it's a mystery. But mostly what I do is the, the usual stuff. I went through the Stanford archives very, very thoroughly, followed up every lead that I could, um, went to Hawaii, went to the Library of Congress. Um, and that's, that's what I do. I mean, my historical technique is I don't sample stuff. I just read everything I could. Here's a question from the online. Uh, the question is, what kind of spiritualism did Jane Stanford practice? And does this have anything to do with theosophy? She was not a theosophist. Um, Jane Stanford's spiritualism was fairly straightforward. She wanted to communicate with her dead son and then later with her dead husband. She attended seances, and she was also influenced very much by Thomas Welton Stanford, whose collections are still in the library. Thomas Welton Stanford was the leading spiritualist in Australia, and Jane went to visit him in Australia. And he hired a whole series of mediums who would get, for example, when Leland Stanford um, Jr. died, he first got in contact not with his parents, he got in contact with Thomas Welton Stanford who he'd actually never met, but I don't pretend to understand the afterworld. In any case, he went and got in touch with that. And there's, what you can find is notations of a seance with Leland Stanford Jr. saying how things are in the um, afterworld in the archives. You'll also find all kinds of apports. The way that um, mediums proved they were actually were communicating with the dead is they brought back all kinds of objects from, let's say, Mesopotamia or ancient Egypt and would deposit them there to prove that, in fact, this was really genuine. So Thomas Welton Stanford had a great deal to do with it. So he had a much more sophisticated spiritualism than Jane Stanford's. Jane Stanford was largely interested in making contact with um, her dead relatives, and also in believing that death was not real. I mean, you can see this in inscriptions in the, churches, in the church. 
that all death was was a change of form. And then not only that, heaven wasn't just eternal, that your soul went there and stayed there. It was another stage in life. You continued to develop. So she had a, that kind of elaborate view. It was in place without heaven, without hell, without doctrine, but it was simply the immortal life of the soul. That's what she believed in. All right, there's a question here. Please just ask the question directly in the microphone. Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much for your remarks. Uh, my name is Mitchell Stevens. I'm a sociologist in the Graduate School of Education, and I've got uh, several of my compatriots here because we're preparing a course for undergraduates next year called Stanford and Its Worlds, uh, and Stanford in the West will be one portion of it. Um, uh, I'm, we're, we're clearly uh, enjoying the, the trashiness of the story that you're telling. <laughs> um, and it strikes me that uh, the origins of a lot of colleges and universities in the United States have this you know, trashy or, or, or prob shall we say uh, morally problematic component. And I can understand why the news on the official histories is always good at some level, um, but at what point, on your view, does it come, become intellectually irresponsible for those, those preternaturally positive origin stories that we tell um, uh, in view books and websites? Uh, when, when, at what point does that become intellectually problematic? Well, I'd say it's always intellectually problematic, but it becomes morally problematic when, and this would be my indictment of what Stanford does by perpetuating these stories, when it becomes a method of raising funds. Stanford tells these stories in order to pretty much deify the original donations to the campus. And that the people who gave those are commemorated not only in names on campus, but in fact on being credit for what the university will later become. Stanford University was really a minor college until after World War II. As Margaret O'Mara's book shows, Stanford becomes what it is today, for better or for worse, with federal government funds following the, the Second World War. So there are two Stanfords. This is the original Stanford, but the origin story remains there. And it's not that they don't go out of their way. The exile of the Stanfords to the mausoleum, there's always a kind of embarrassment. But one of the things that got me started was, like anybody who's ever taught here, you walk on campus and there's this endless array of undergraduates walking backwards, <laughs> telling you a set of stories which are not entirely true. And they're usually given to people who want to enroll here, people telling stories about the campus. That's the kind of stuff where the point is, you know, what hasn't changed about Stanford, it's about the money. Um, <laughs> The one thing they're not going to tell you that they would, I would never be able to see, I could get into the old endowment and realize, whoa, this endowment is really sketchy. I could never get into the endowment today. <laughs> in a million years, you will not learn what is going on in the Stanford endowment. That's the serious stuff. Uh, we, we have questions that are coming in from online. What evidence do you have an intimate relation, of an intimate relationship between Berner and Beverly? It's a very good question. What I have is um, gossip and police accounts. Um, Berner is going to hint at it once you know what the document, what she's talking about in, the, um, in her own memoir. And when they're caught in embezzlement, virtually everybody who says it says that they have a relationship between them, which is why Berner got sucked into the embezzlement. Sucked in might be the wrong word here. Because there are signs that Ber Beverly was not the first one to embezzle from the Stanfords, and that Berner may have had a sexual relationship with Leland Stanford's senior secretary, who also was embezzling from the Stanfords. So this this was in in, in many ways. I mean, I don't want to sound like this is part of the Gilded Age soap opera stuff, but servants in Gilded Age America and Gilded Age Great Britain thought it was their right to pad bills and embezzle money. Um, they're not paid much, as Beverly at one point tells. Um, Bertha Berner, when they're touring the world, he says, do you think I'm doing this for my health? Um, I'm doing this because it's the only way I can make money out of this job. So this is a C as part of what's going on. So mostly what I have is gossip, um, a series of incidents which all support the gossip. Um, but at no point does Bertha Berner ever say any of that. But Bertha Berner will say on the last trip she wants Beverly to go with them because she had a horrible time with Jane Stanford when she tried to deal with her by herself. 
Do you have a question here? Um, his name is Ah Wing, is that correct? Yeah. I was struck by your mentioning that this could have gone in another direction, uh, and someone could have paid a fatal price for all of these shenanigans, and yet it didn't go that way. So uh, I just want to express my surprise. And also I want to say that we're saying that these people are morally suspect, and yet it, it could have gone even farther, and it didn't. Yeah. Ah Wing, the letter incriminating Ah Wing, which is a very complicated letter, is still in the Stanford archives. And the police detective who was in charge of that, and I go through in some detail why he had contact with the person who wrote that letter and why it incriminated Ah Wing. Ah Wing, as my guess is, was set up to take the fall for this. But it didn't because Jordan had succeeded in saying there was no murder. If there was no murder, you can't indict any of the murderous suspects. So everybody walks because of this. So nobody involved in this has any incentive to question any of it. Um, there is one person who I suspect, my brother Stephen more than me, suspects did take a fall for it, but again, you'll have to read the book. That'll, that'll give that away. A question here, please. Thanks, yeah, this is super interesting. Um, could you say more about the Ross affair? Uh, you suggested that it was over, in part, over Jane Stanford's views on race and his. Um, yeah, could you say more about what those contrasting views yeah, were? Um, Race in this story is very, very complicated. I mean, what it is is Ross was a eugenicist, much like Jordan was a eugenicist, as much like many of the faculty at Stanford were eugenicists in the early 20th century. It was a very common belief among progressive intellectuals. Um, Jordan and Ross differed because Jordan made Japanese honorary white people. And um, he didn't criticize the Chinese because the Chinese staffed to built the railroad. Ross attacked Japanese immigration. Ross also attacked um, the railway company, Street Railways in San Francisco that Jane Stanford held a large share in. But the critical thing I think that Ross did is he attacked Leland Stanford himself and in a classroom. He was supposedly said that a railroad deal was a railroad steal and that um, the origins of the Stanford fortune were um, suspect. And that, that was it. I mean, pretty much at that point, she wants him gone. They'll cite a whole series of things for it. And Jordan, who ad actually admires Ross, does not want him gone. Jordan tries to protect Ross. Jordan fails to protect Ross. He then tries to, I mean, this world is so weird that it's sometimes even I was astonished. He then tries to trade Ross to another university, like he was a baseball player. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you Ross if you'll give me an equal sociologist. But no sociologist wants to come to Stanford, so that doesn't, that doesn't work. So in the end, he tells Ross, you've got to go. But he's already, Ross, he's already given documents to Ross that makes it very clear that Ross is being dismissed by Jane Stanford for the reasons I just stated. And at that point, he can't do anything against Ross because Ross will reveal the documents. Jane Stanford wants him to take the responsibility. The whole thing blows up into a giant academic standard s scandal. Stanford's um, seen as a sort of poster child for the suppression of academic freedom. And it's a, probably the worst single academic disaster Stanford had in its history. Yes, you want to follow up? Yeah. So was Jane Stanford an anti-eugenicist? And was she some kind of you know, racial egalitarian of her no, time? No, she it wasn't. Seems, no. It seems implausible, she, she but... She wasn't. She just hated different people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is still the United States. <laughs> this is there are different groups who are, get, who are going to get the thing. Jane Stanford did not like Irish servants, for example. Um, there's a whole... Even though she was going to convert to Catholicism, it becomes very, very complicated. She is not an egalitarian. Um, but neither is she a eugenicist, but she's horrified by evolution. One of the things she's horrified about Stanford is, is Jordan, of course, believes in evolution. Evolution is taught at Stanford. The Catholics are attacking her all the time that evolution is being taught here. So she's anti-evolution, but not necessarily. She certainly isn't a eugenicist. It, it becomes very hard, I and mean, it's one of the challenges of going back to the past, to make the beliefs coherent. Any more than if we had to make our beliefs coherent, um, that would be a task that I, I myself would not undertake. 
Did you disagree with any of Dr. Robert Cutler's book, an online questioner asked? No, I just, Cutler's um, stuff on the medical stuff is, is perfect. Cutler admires Jane Stanford a great deal and thought, saw Jane Stanford as the victim of all of this. Um, but that's because Cutler didn't do much research on the university. He mostly did research on the medical procedure. So I use him all the time. I am not a physician. And so I rely very heavily on Cutler, who um, goes through that in great detail. Um, a question from uh, uh, online. Why did Elliot of Harvard say that Stanford was a gigantic money laundering scheme? Because <laughs> one of the things that happens is once the court case goes before the Supreme Court, which is a very fishy case, um, David Starr Jordan goes to Elliot and other university um, presidents and says, the fate of American higher education is at stake. And Elliot essentially says, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> there's really no other university quite like Stanford. And from everything that I've seen, it's an attempt by a family to launder ill-gotten gains and create a monument for themselves. A member of the class of 1970 asks, oh, me, ask, when and how did Stanford sanitize the unsavory reputation it had during the Sta Jane Stanford, David Starr Jordan era? Um, Stanford, I don't think, fully reinvents itself till after World War II. And even today, among academics, when you talk about the Ross Affair, it goes back to Stanford and about academic freedom. Stanford, in some ways, has never um, lived that down. What they can now do is say, well, Ross was a eugenicist, so he should have been fired. He was a racist. But that was not really the issue at the time. The issue was academic freedom and also political rights, because Ross was in trouble for other things. He um, campaigned for the... Um, against the gold standard, and Jane Stanford was for the gold standard, and she said faculty should not be involved in politics, ignoring the fact that most of her faculty was for the gold standard and advancing that on the other side. So it's, it's you know, there's a whole bunch of different things going on there. Was right. there a question that somebody had? Did someone have a question over here? Yeah. Well, please, you yeah. come down to the microphone. We'll, we'll take you. Next, I'll, while you're coming out, I'll just ask a question here. <laughs> no, no. Oh, no, 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 please come on. Please why don't come, you come down? Come, and come on down, please. That's right. <laughs> we just have to record it. <laughs> That's all right. Switching to Hawaii, I'm curious about the relevant timelines of the last few hours and what your research and visit proved or uncovered. Um, pretty much on this one, the accounts are pretty consistent, and I go through with Cutler and the other documents that I found are the same. Most of what I found is I, comparing very closely police questioning reports that came in and what Jordan does with the Waterhouse report. What I buttress here is that Jordan and a doctor named Waterhouse get Bertha Burner to reverse virtually everything she testified under oath to before um, the coroner's jury and to renounce what she had said. And that is what Jordan is there for. So that part I go through a great deal. I follow through several of the people. There are a bunch of leads I could not follow up, you know, that Callendon makes a very mysterious trip to Chinatown. Who knows what's going on? Um, there's other things, but basically the core of it, yeah, I, I'm, I hew fairly closely to um, Cutler's interpretation there, but with far more detail. Ask your question, please. Uh, hello. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Elliot Reichart. Um, I was wondering what kind of were the stakes for you in telling this story? And like, what kind of intervention you wanted to make into, or were, was that like, what, what was the motivations for it? Because it seems to have real stakes for how we think about universities today and their Well, histories. I mean, I, I've always been interested about the influence of money on universities. But the real stake in this, me originally, was teaching the class. Quite literally, after the class was over, the students reached a set of conclusions, which I'm not saying they were wrong about, but there was no way that I could fulfill the argument. I did not have enough evidence. And it just kept bothering me. So there are a series of things that in the end, I, you know, especially as you reach a certain age, 
you cannot do a book that's going to take you 10 years. Um, <laughs> and so this one, I'd done part of the research through the classes, and I had a few years, and you know, I could go through the Stanford archives, the stuff were here. So a lot of it is, is what you know, historians might argue something else, but it's my same thing about how I do research. I was just curious. I was just really curious about what had happened here. And the stakes of what, the, what is at stake here is how universities um, are dependent on the money that's give them, given them and the role of the people who gave them the money. I rarely thought, and when I started out, I did not think that the end of the story would be it's going to cost the donor their death. And actually, the sh high sheriff of Hawaii says, nobody's ever going to give me money to a university again. They'll kill him to get the money quicker. So, um, <laughs> So that's not true, but that, that is the kind of larger question that I had in mind. Here's a question from a faculty member online who says, your talk illustrates the importance, but also the fragility of the archive. Normally, one thinks of the archive as revealing, but in your story, it is concealed. Did public memory and myth f function in revealing of the story? How does one find pockets of, quote, how it actually was, unquote? How do you determine what is an authentic representation of the past? There's no way you can determine any single document is an authentic reputation, representation of the past. All you can do is put the documents in conversation with each other. So the thing is, no historian, at least no good historian, would ever claim that this is the truth and this is false. What a good historian will claim is the preponderance of the evidence indicates this is really what happened. And if you give me another version, I can shoot that down. And the way I can shoot it down is a story has to be complete. What I'm trying to do in the archive is account for every single piece of evidence that seems relevant to the story. A bad history is one where you um, throw out the pieces that don't fit. And all a good historian has to do to dismantle your story is retrieve that piece of evidence and bring it back in. So what I'm trying to do here, through the tangents and all the things I go through, is to bring it out. These are the things of the elements here. And this is the best story I can create to include all these pieces of relevant information. But in no time does the whole story depend on this account is true, this account is false. Because in fact, the lies are what I really want. <laughs> the lies are, why are you saying this, when in fact it can be so easily disrupted? When Bertha Berner says, we didn't think she'd been poisoned because we just thought somebody had put cleaning fluid in her um, Poland Spring bottled water. Really? You use strychnine in cleaning fluid? Um, I mean, it's once you begin to get that. But those you can dismantle easily. The critical thing, and I give away too much, is I began to realize this happened and nobody will talk about it. And so I zeroed in on that, the thing that they wouldn't talk about is the thing that ends up being most critical to the mystery. And I won't tell you anymore. I'll tell you too much already. Now, uh, uh, was the Board of Trustees unanimous in its support of David Starr Jordan's version of what happened? And if there were dissenters, how many? And what um, did they do? There were some dissenters. You have to understand the Board of Trustees. The Board of Trustees had virtually no power in early Stanford universities. Power came from that Jane Stanford was head of the Board of Trustees. And Crothers, who's trying to protect the documents, is, is very clever. I mean, Crothers is writing to himself. When you go through Crothers' papers, this, this is a guy who can't tell anybody but himself, so he's writing all this stuff down. So he tells you, well, I nominated these two guys to be um, on the board of trustees. This one hates me because he hates my brother. And so by putting them up together, nobody can say I'm packing the board of trustees, because why would I nominate one of my enemies? But he's really getting the guy he really wants on there at the same combination. So the Board of Trustees is very complicated. Many of them were old cronies of Leland Stanford. And they were mostly interested in making money off of it. Timothy Hopkins speculates on town sites. Um, Timothy Hopkins is underbidding people for contracts. Con our, our, um, excuse me, contracts. A lot of it is nickel and dime stuff. But the Board of, the board of Trustees is suspect in and of itself. I'll stop there. <laughs> oh, yes, please. Yeah, I have a quick question for you. Why did you think that uh, Jane Stanford might have wanted to commit suicide? So what was the suicide angle there? The suicide angle is going to be around spiritualism. 
Um, even though, in fact, I see no sign that she did, people said she's missed her dead son and her dead husband so much, even though she said she talked to them all the time. She missed them, <laughs> she missed them so much that they thought she just was tired of life and wanted to pass over into the other world. And that's what's going on. The other thing that happens, too, is there's a, a strychnine poisoning I found. One of the, uh, the wife of an old employee of Leland Stanford who worked for the university commits suicide by taking rat poisoning just before Jane Stanford is poisoned. It's all over the newspapers here. So it gives whoever is thinking about rat poison, and she had committed suicide. She was tired of life. They thought, hmm, is what I think they thought. If Jane Stanford swallows this, it could look like Mrs. Sula's death. So that's, you know, that's it. But I saw no evidence that, in fact, she was committing suicide. But that's one of the things. They would have said she committed suicide, except that would be worse than being murdered. Yes, your question, please. Uh, thank you for your outstanding presentation. Your brief remark about uh, the period after World War II being Stanford's rise in reputation piques my interest. I'm aware of one book uh, which dates back perhaps to the mid-1990s called Creating the Cold War University, the Transformation of Stanford, and I'm sorry I don't remember the author. Uh, can you recommend any other works uh, that might lead to learning more about the rise in the reputation of Stanford under J.E. Wallace Sterling's administration? Well, Sterling not particularly, but Margaret O'Mara's account of how Stanford and the modern research of university rises is the best one. So Margaret O'Mara is O-M-A-R-A. -A. Um, she, it's about five years old now, and as usual, it's really embarrassing. I hope Margaret is not listening to this. I'm blanking on the title. Cities, cities of Knowledge. Cities of Knowledge is far and away the best account of the rise of Stanford um, and universities like it. Yes, um, I think we have time for one more question. And uh, before I ask that question. Did, uh, is, did you want to say something? Yes, I have a question. Okay. Here. Before before answering the, asking the last question, is there yeah, something you Okay, yeah. you're going to say it. Okay. <laughs> this is all this is all prearranged, so of yeah, course right. I screwed it up. Uh, just a a very brief uh, comment. We're going to have a reception afterwards, uh, and uh, uh, there, and also there are books uh, on sale from the book department, and uh, Professor White was agreed to sign all books. Uh, I also want to just point out that this program is sponsored by the Stanford Historical Society. We do about eight programs a year. All are free and open to the public. We welcome new members and donations to support our programs. Anyone can be a member. Please visit our website at historicalsociety.stanford.edu and sign up to join us and receive notices of future programs. Now, the last question is uh, here, um, one person asks, have you read the book, Why Fish Don't Exist? And do you agree with its characterization of David Starr Jordan? Uh, yeah, this is where things get sort of incestuous. Um, when Lulu Miller wrote that book, she came and interviewed me, and I opened up the class papers we'd done and the stuff about um, the investigation of Jane Stanford's murder. So asking me if I agree with Lulu Miller would cause me to renounce somebody who, in fact, used materials my students had gathered to write her book. But she also was, is terrific about David Starr Jordan. I mean, she gives a, a very sympathetic, but um, in the end, very cutting account of what he did. So they have also, I know from other sources, that all incoming undergraduates next year are going to have to read Lulu Miller's book. <laughs> Which is something I can confidently tell you they will never have to do about who killed Jane Stanford. <laughs> I'd like to thank Richard White for his presentation. For and please join us for the reception. <laughs>